Greetings, welcome to Raven's Roost Forge. This is Tate, your host, and today we're going to take a cheap hammerhead and remake it into a rounding hammer for blacksmithing. Let's get to it! So the first thing I'm going to do here is just cut the haft off of the hammerhead. Now this will make it a lot easier for us to do the work and I'm going to actually do some reforging on this hammerhead so this is a must. To remove the haft I'm just using an inexpensive pull style Japanese saw from Harbor Freight. It works great. I'm going to keep this handle and reuse it because it's still plenty long enough for when I reheft the hammerhead. Next I'm going to drill some holes in what's left of the handle that's sticking out of the bottom of the hammerhead. I'm using a step bit in order to do this and I'm just drilling down about halfway into what's left. I just did a series of holes so that uh, it will collapse when I try to punch out the what's left of the wood. I'm going to flush cut it and then use a tapered punch in order to drive what's left of that handle out. If you've drilled out enough of the wood then it should be pretty easy to punch it out. Flush cutting it before you try to punch it helps because then the fibers don't mushroom over the top and uh, block you getting it out of the hammerhead. And you can see it drop out the bottom in just a moment. There it went. I am going to do a little reforging on this hammerhead, mostly for aesthetic reasons, but I don't want the eye to get distorted when I do that. So I'm going to do my best to only heat up the faces. One of the things that I'm going to do when I reforge this is I'm going to start the rounding face by um, hammering it into a die on my treadle hammer here. And this is just going to get that started so I have to do less grinding. But this is not really necessary. You could do it without that die. You could just grind the rounding face on there. So you can see I did my best to keep from heating up the eye but the edges of the eye still started to get a little hot and I was concerned that it might still deform but it was actually perfectly fine and I didn't need to do any dressing in order to get the haft to fit in it when we got to that point. So the next thing that I'm going to do is use these spring fullers in order to uh, create a fuller just behind the face on uh, both sides of the hammer and this is keeping with the kind of Brian Brazil style of rounding hammer which is mostly aesthetic but I do feel that it has a little bit of a functional purpose and it makes it a little bit easier to uh, forge with the edges of the face and use those kind of fullering blows um, but it's mostly for looks. The spring fuller that I'm using here is just made of two pieces of 4140 round bar. I believe it's 5 8 inch round and then is uh, welded to a spring that's made out of mild steel. It's pretty simple to make. Just preheat the 4140 so that it doesn't crack. The only thing that's a little tricky about this process is making sure that you keep the fullering marks lined up as you work your way around the hammer. Um, so start with light indentations and then uh, make sure that everything lines up before you really start whaling on it. I like the octagonal shape so I'm going to maintain that. You can see here I'm just kind of crisping up those flats periodically as I work. As I mentioned the fullers are mostly aesthetic so you don't need to do this part. But if you want the fullers and you don't have a treadle hammer or a power hammer, just mount a hardy shank onto your spring fuller and then you can do the fullering at the anvil. So you can see I did the fullering process on both sides. I didn't show the other side because it's exactly the same. I let it cool off without quenching because I didn't want to harden it. 
So now I'm just using a flap disc with a rounded over edge in order to clean up everything that needs to be cleaned up, especially those little fuller grooves. This is just a cheap hammer from Harbor Freight. And so it has some kind of casting blemishes on each side. And that's what you can see me kind of grinding on when I'm grinding on the side of that uh, hammer. So the next thing I'm doing is cleaning up the inside of the eye with an air file. There's some casting blemishes in there, but the main thing is to make sure that you got a nice soft chamfer all the way around the uh, edge of the eye on both sides. This way it doesn't uh, damage any of the wood fibers when you mount the haft to it. You don't want to accidentally cut into the fibers because that reduces the strength of the connection between the haft and the hammer. Ideally what you want is the wood fibers as they enter the hammerhead to become compressed and not uh, cut or get splintered because that's going to give you the strongest connection. So I put a nice chamfer around the opening and I'll do the same on the other side in a moment but there's still some irregularities inside that eye that are driving me nuts so you can see me going at them with a file. And then the next step is to dress those faces on the belt sander. You could also do this with an angle grinder. I just feel like I have a little more control with the belt grinder. So I'm working on the flat face here and it just gets a gentle crown and a generous chamfer around the edge. This is a 120 grit belt. And then in a moment I'm gonna switch to the rounding side and obviously I'm gonna do a much more generous crown on the rounding side and also a generous chamfer around the edge. So now I'm going to work on the rounding side and I switched to a lower grip belt so I could remove material a little more quickly. Um, now I started the rounding face by pre-forging into that die but I still have a little bit of work in order to get it the right shape. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just going to give it a nice generous crown, um, not going too deep on any one pass and then I'm gonna give it a nice generous chamfer around the edge. When you're dressing hammer faces, whether you're dressing a flat face or a rounding face or a peen or whatever, it can be important to rotate the hammer frequently as you're grinding it because if you have it in one orientation the whole time you're likely to make it uneven um, and that can cause you a lot of problems. I'm using the slack part of the belt to really blend in the chamfer around the edge and then here I'm switching to a uh, uh, non-woven abrasive belt like a Scotch-Brite kind of a belt and then I'm going to go over the faces with the Scotch-Brite that really makes it a lot easier to blend in um, any hard surfaces you know, and make it nice and smooth and uh, gives it a nice luster as well when you use the Scotch-Brite. This is a heavy cut Scotch-Brite and then I think I'm going to switch to a medium cut uh, in just a moment. Once I polish the faces, you could see me go around and kind of knock down any sharper corners and round everything over um, before we go to the heat treat in just a little bit. Okay, here we are. Everything's polished up and ready to go into the heat treat. So we're going to heat it up. And um, I think I lost a little bit of the footage here later on in the heat treat when I actually go to quench it but you'll see that I'm heating it to just above 1500 degrees and then we're going to quench in water, warm water. 
since the camera cut out for the quench, here's my dramatic reenactment. Imagine that was red hot when it went in there. You want to agitate until the water stops boiling and then go straight into the oven for a temper. This is going to temper at 400 degrees. And then I'm going to do a second temper later. So it's going to temper in the oven for an hour and a half. I think a double temper is always a good idea for a striking tool. And then we're going to go ahead and polish the faces. The second temper is going to be a flame temper. And so we want to be able to see the temper colors on the face uh, on each side. So you want to polish both faces before you do the flame temper. And we're going to do this um, in the blacksmith vise. And I just have a piece of steel mounted in the blacksmith vise. And then I'm going to lay a piece of fire brick on there. And the hammer is going to go on sideways so that I can direct the flame through the eye of the hammer. That way the center of the hammer will heat up the quickest and the uh, faces will actually heat up more slowly. This will make the body of the hammer soft and the hammer faces will stay relatively hard. We're going to keep going until we get a nice bronze color on the face on the faces of the hammer. So you can see here that I'm switching sides frequently so that I'm directing flames um, into each side of the eye uh, roughly the same amount. This makes sure that we get an even heating uh, throughout the whole body of the hammer. You can see that the faces are starting to turn bronze now. And I'm going to keep going until we've got a really nice deep, deep, rich bronze color. And then we're going to go into the quench tank. And that will arrest the tempering process so that the faces don't get any softer. So here it is after the tempering process. You can see that nice rich bronze on the faces. And I wrote uh, 1.75 kilograms on the side, which is slightly less than four pounds. We started with a four pound hammerhead. And then I took it to the sandblaster and I gave it a good sandblasting. Um, and then I'm, here you can see I'm gonna stamp the weight onto the top of the head um, and the center of the hammer should be relatively soft but it still took a little bit of work to get the stamps in there. So I'm just going to use kind of a rubberized uh, polishing disc on the angle grinder. I think this is two, uh, 220 grit in order to polish the faces back up after the sandblasting. You could use it with the faces sandblasted like that but um, I want a little bit more of a polished uh, face on the hammers and that'll give a little bit of a better texture when you forge with it. So I'll just go through the same polishing step on the rounding side of the hammer. You see I'm kind of just polishing around the edges and then I'm going all along the face just to get the chamfers and the face nice and polished up. Okay, so we're nearing the end here. You could haft the hammerhead as is, but I want to clean it off with some, some denatured alcohol. And then uh, I'm going to use some cold bluing on the body of the hammer in order to make it look a little nicer. And then we're going to put a little boiled linseed oil over that in order to preserve it uh, so that it doesn't rust or anything. And then in the next video, we're going to mount it on the haft. So any cold bluing will work. I use a clean bore or black magic. Uh, it works really well and just shaking it up a little bit and then a little bit on a piece of paper towel. I'm just going to wipe down the body of the hammer with it. Uh, give it a moment to dry and then we're going to wash it off with uh, soap and water. Dry it and then add the uh, boiled linseed oil in order to preserve the finish.
we need to do a thorough job of cleaning off the cold bluing residue because it is an acid and so if you leave any residue on there then it's going to promote rust and obviously we don't want the head of this hammer to rust up uh, especially after taking all this time to make it nice. So the last step here is to put a little coat of boiled linseed oil. It makes the finish really pop and it darkens that metal nicely. It's also going to protect it. You could really use any kind of an oil here, but you do want to oil it. I like the boiled linseed oil because it will dry and harden and it'll leave a nice protective film on there. When you apply boiled linseed oil to metal, you want to just give it a really nice light coating because it's not going to absorb obviously like it does when you uh, put it on a wood surface. All right, a little sneak preview of what the completed hammer looks like. If you stick around for the next video, then I'll show you how to mount the hammer head on that haft. I hope you enjoyed the video and you learned something. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, happy forging.